Welcome to the Terminal Value Podcast. We have Dave Hollenbach with us today, and we're going to be talking about his leadership journey through PTSD. Uh, so Dave uh, was actually a member of a number of very busy fire stations, and he unfortunately experienced a number of things that probably human beings should not have to experience. And so one of the things that, he, that he's done as he went through his own PTSD is he's actually chosen to share that with people and to help them with coming through their life's journey and really developing you know, a leadership style that's really transparent and really authentic. So Dave, please, uh, please introduce yourself and uh, let's go and get the conversation going. Yeah. Uh, thank you for, for having me on and, uh, you know, sharing your platform with me to get the word out. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Well, yeah, so you know, I, um, t- uh, yeah, tell us a little bit about what your, about your journey. Yeah, so I, I spent 23 years in the fire service. Prior to that, I was in the Navy. Thank you for your uh, service, both to both in fire and the Navy. You know, I, I was just really, you know, I was following in my dad's footsteps. He had been in the Navy. After the Navy, he became a firefighter. And yeah. at a very early age, my mom and dad got divorced. And, you know, a lot of times when I saw him, it would be when he, you know, rode in the fire truck up to the school to yeah. you know, say hi to the classes and, you know, I'd see him on the weekends and stuff, but, you know, I always looked up to my dad and and I wanted to be like him. And so, you know, as I grew up, I started really wanting to do those things. Just had a real passion for the fire service and I was good at it. <laughs> you uh-huh. know, it, it really felt like it was just this natural ability. I had been in a lot of sketchy situations and yeah, you know, I've mm-hmm. been afraid, had some pretty severe injuries. And September 8th, 2001, I fell off of a three-story apartment building and broke my back. And what at the time seemed like this devastating setback, I I feel like probably saved my life. September 8th, 2001 is three days before September 11th, 2001. Correct. And a lot of my brothers and sisters in the fire service went to Manhattan, yeah. mm-hmm. went to ground zero and helped. And a lot of them developed respiratory issues, different types of cancers and, and died horrible deaths. And I feel like I would have been one of them yeah. had I not fallen off the roof and broken my back. And so there's a lesson in a lot of the things that I talk about in my book that all these times in our life where we feel kind of hopeless or overwhelmed, or we're just in this really dark space, that's temporary. And uh-huh. you don't know what value is going to come from that experience. And, and that's really the lesson that I've learned through struggling with PTSD and, and making some really poor decisions in my personal life. Uh, I ended up losing my career. I had a very, very successful career in the fire service. I was a very well-respected chief officer, three years as the chief of special operations in my department. And then three years, I, well, a little more than three years, at the end of my career, I was responsible for six fire stations. And two of them were special operations stations. The department is a very large metropolitan fire department, you know, seven battalions. I was responsible for one of them and learned a a lot of really valuable things, but I was struggling in my, in my personal life and nightmares, not sleeping and just really pursuing all the wrong things, you know, the, the, when you're when you're in a dark place, you want to feel good. You're chasing that dopamine fix, and so you, you make some stupid decisions, or you, you know you start drinking, or you know some will turn to drugs. You know I'm human. I, I did some stupid stuff, and uh, and I lost my career. And what I thought was the end of my life really opened my eyes to a lot of possibilities. Yeah. Well, and, uh, you know, just as a little bit of a tangent, you, you're very clearly not the first person who this kind of thing has happened to. And so one of the things at least that I've observed is that with a lot of pyramid shaped uh, hierarchies, which is how pretty much any, you know, corporate or government structure is built, what ends up happening is your competition for those top spots is, you know, is so intense that in order to really kind of, as I would say, have a shot, you really at a fairly early point in your career essentially have to basically make 
all of your life about your career. And so then what, what that does is I think that ultimately results in a very unbalanced life, you know, which is why a lot of people end up, you either you know, beca- can become addicted to painkillers or yeah. you know, develop alcoholism or any number of other coping mechanisms, just because they have, they're trying to put so much in, you know, so much effort into ascending. And there's, you know, a lot of collateral damage that happens out throughout their life. You know, now I don't know that this is something that I have the ability to unilaterally fix, but I think this is actually what the great resignation is really about too, is that I think there are a lot of people who are really recognizing this and saying, Hey, wait, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not interested in that. You know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not looking at essentially ignoring every other facet of my life just to have a shot at ascending. Yeah, no, I I agree. I've had multiple conversations on that very point. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, and I think that it's actually, uh, you know, I really appreciate your authenticity and sharing your story because, you know, I know know, speaking for myself, right. I'm a Gen Xer, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, us Gen Xers are, you know, we're raised very much in the, there is a right way and a wrong way to have your career. And the right way is, you know, you're supposed to go to school. You're supposed to get a degree in a, in a sensible major, you know, forget about that passion nonsense. It needs to be something that, you know, where you'll be able to get a good job, and then you're supposed to, you know, notice the grindstone on your career and then maybe go to graduate school. And, you know, then of course, you know, your house, family, bigger house, you know, all that kind of stuff. And it just kind of compounds out. And, but there's not really a, uh, I, I think that there's, there, there, there wasn't really, at least some kind of my formative upbringing, there wasn't really that realization that, you know, there are real trade-offs that you're going to have to make. And in order to ascend, it will cost you uh, quite a bit in your personal and family life. I'm with you. Uh, I'm 48 yeah. years old and uh, yeah, I followed that same path. I mean, I, yeah. it took me a while to get my master's degree, but uh, yeah, I did get it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, so for, from your experience, what would you say is that most valuable leadership lesson that you've learned? That it's not about me. It's about the people I'm leading, mm-hmm. adding value to them. You have to genuinely care about the people that you're leading, care about their success. I think that's the the biggest lesson that I learned. And it took me a while, but it seemed like that came natural when uh-huh. I was in the position that I was in, I, I had worked my way up to uh, become a lieutenant. I was yeah. a lieutenant of a station as a company officer. I just recognized h- how well the individuals responded to, because I, I actually really did genuinely care about them and wanted them to succeed. And it was uh it's kind of a a contrast when I'd been working with other crews and I, you know, see how the, the company officer was a real jerk, you know, seemed like they were very self-absorbed. Yeah. You know, the, the morale was not good. People didn't like working for that individual and they would try and find another station to work at. When I was a company officer, I'd have firefighters transferring in, you know, trying yeah. to work with me, or they would even, if they were on a different shift, come and, and train with my crew on their day yeah. slot. I, I think when you have that at your core as a leader, you can't help but be successful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's uh, really powerful. And now, okay, so, you know, let's say somebody's listening and, you know, what you're saying is really resonating. Now, in your experience, how, how do you put that in practice? I mean, because of course, right, you can you can very clearly put that in practice for your own leadership. But if you're trying to to influence an organization, you know, you're trying to have that people based leadership. You know, if you if it's con- you know, if it's counter to the culture of the organization you're working in, it can be really tricky. Uh, you know, is that something you've experienced? And if so, how do you navigate it? Yes. So, like I said, I worked for a very large metropolitan fire department. And I felt that it really, it was many different fire departments all in one. You know, there was battalions and shifts where everybody loved coming to work and other battalions and shifts and stations where they were just miserable. And to change the culture of a large organization is very difficult. And it's got to be from the top down you have to have extremely strong leadership at the top. And 
a lot of really good communication. The values of that leader need to be communicated over and over and over again and consistently, concisely, and not just from, you know, different figureheads from that leader. That can be difficult in a very large organization. I mean, they have their responsibilities, their day-to-day, but they've got to make time to, you know, connect with the people that are doing the hard work, doing yeah. doing the the lowest job of the organization. Like they need to feel as though they're valued. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, well, and, you know, because I think the mental construct that I've always had in every leadership position that I've been in is that, uh, you know, is that my responsibility is to increase the productive value of the people who are in my organization by an amount greater to greater than my own salary. Otherwise, I'm destroying value. And so, you know, because kind of, you know, at least with, with that kind of lens, you know, my view of leadership takes on a very heavy teaching and coaching uh, type of uh, you know, type of emphasis, you know, because the whole idea is that, you know, what you know, we, we, you have a kind of a productive output value capacity, whatever of your team on January 1st. By December 31st, that that needs to be higher. And then next year the clock resets. Um, and at least that, you know, that, that's the way that I think about it. You know, I'm I'm not trying, I'm I'm sure I'm not the first first person to come up with that idea, but but that's no, the way I, that I mentally code it. I, I think that you'll find that in very successful organizations, regardless of what they produce or what they do, uh, you'll find that. When the leadership, when the organization invests in the people that work there, it can't help but prosper. Yeah. You know, because that is the the biggest asset of that organization. It's not the stuff. It's not the computers. It's not the, the vehicles. It's, you know, not the buildings. It's the people. And yeah. you have to view them as an asset and invest in them because they're just going to become more and more valuable or they're going to deteriorate the value of the organization. I com- completely and totally agree. Okay. Well, let's see. So I'd like to kind of pivot the conversation a little bit. And so, you know, I, I don't necessarily, I don't know that we need to get into the details of your, your personal PTSD or your personal trauma, but you know, I think it's something, it's very clearly something that, that you have found a way to, to turn into something positive in your life. You know, talk me through a little bit about that journey, just, you know, because I know a lot of people, whether it's, you know, you know, w- whether it's personal life trauma, whether it's career trauma, whether it's just the fact that we've all, li- you know, that we live in, you know, social, political, uh, you know, so you know, media bombardment age, it, there's basically a 24 by seven machine that's designed to feed people's anxiety. People are carrying a lot of trauma and anxiety. And I think that it's, you know, being able to pivot that into something uh, positive is just really powerful. On my website, I have a resources page where there's yeah. a, a lot of mental health resources and they're they're geared for you know veterans combat vets and and first responders but i also have some information in there about the ace study ace is an acronym it stands for adverse childhood experiences and there was this huge study done and what that information the the research tells us that very large percentages of our population have experienced trauma of some form Mm -hmm. in in their childhood, you know? And I went through my life feeling like, you know, nobody understands what I've been through, but the reality is that there's a lot of people that have had some pretty messed up stuff done to them when they were a kid. And, uh, you know, there's, it's not just physical trauma or, you know, sexual abuse or verbal abuse, there's neglect, there's mm-hmm. you know, just, you know, not feeling safe. You know, there yeah. are those kinds of things, but that translates into a vulnerability later on in life where either, you know, your relationships are going to suffer, your career is going to suffer. If you go into, you know, the combat arms or public safety, chances are you're going to experience even more trauma yeah and you're already set up to be predisposed to 
for PTSD, to struggle with yeah. PTSD. And I fit into that category. So 23 years in the fire service, running a, a lot of calls in some rough parts of town because yeah. the rough parts of town are the busy parts. And if you're a gung-ho firefighter, that's where you're going to gravitate to. You're going to go yeah. where the action is. And that's what I did. And, and I saw a lot of really bad stuff that when I was young, I, I just felt like it would go away. But that stuff stays with you. And I found that later on in my career, things were bubbling up. And mm -hmm. I was, you know, having some issues in my marriage, uh, probably was drinking more than I should have. You know, I, I ended up getting help, but it's not a one and done. Yeah. And when no. you're working on healing from PTSD, I, I feel like I've got a long ways to go and I feel like I'll be working on myself until I die. You know, I, I think that it's a constant effort to continue to heal. Yeah. You know, there, there's, there's a lot of things that I've seen. I, even when I feel like I am, am good, out of nowhere, something will hit me and it's, it can put you in a spin. And, uh, and so with that, you have to have good self-leadership skills. You have to be self-aware, especially if you're in a leadership position. Yeah. If you're not good at leading yourself, and you're struggling with PTSD and you're lying to yourself or you're lying to the people around you that know something's wrong, you're, you're affecting those relationships and you're affecting your ability to lead effectively. And I didn't recognize that in my professional career. Mm -hmm. was, I mean, I was very successful and I was doing my job well. Thankfully, I didn't make any mistakes yeah. or, you know, big mistakes in my professional career. You know, and when you're in a leadership position, you're going to make mistakes. The goal is to minimize those mistakes and, yeah. and minimize the impact to, to the organization. Uh, you know, especially when you're making decisions with very limited information in a compressed time period. And it's not until things are really rolling that you can see the effects of your earlier decisions. So, yeah. But the, the importance of self-leadership and that ownership, own your mistakes, own your trauma, and get help. Because yeah. if you don't, it's just going to fester and, and get worse. Uh, and, and so, you know, I, I found myself in a position where you know, I thought I was going to be working another 10 years in the fire service. And I was told that my services were no longer wanted or needed. And, uh, and so it wasn't very pleasant. You know, that's a, that's a hard pill, pill to swallow. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah. And, but I, I, I can tell you this, that in my career, so many lessons that I learned I felt like I had a lot of value still, a lot of value that I could share. And that is really what led me to start my podcast. Yeah. What led me to, you know, write my book and, and actually publish it because there is a lot of personal stuff in there. I am very open about the mistakes that I've made and open about the traumas that I've, I've endured. And, uh, you know, I, I lay out a plan for people to, you know, overcome those, those issues. And it's not just like, you don't have to be a combat vet or a public yeah. safety person, you know, work in the mean streets of Detroit or something like that to have trauma, you know, people lose family members, people, people are traumatized in ways that, yeah. And I know, and, and you can feel very isolated. And that's the thing that I want people to know. I was there. I, I felt isolated. I felt like nobody could understand me and nobody really cared. And, you know, here I am, this huge failure. The reality is that there is a lot of people that can relate to that. Mm -hmm. There was multiple people that came to me, gave me a hand up, helped yeah. me, 
helped me get back on my feet and get my head screwed on straight so that I could push on. And that's, and that's trying to pay it forward, I guess. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, uh, really appreciate you uh, sharing with us today, Dave. So, you know, before we're, uh, you know, before we're done for, uh, for this conversation, uh, make sure to let everybody know where they can find out some more about you, you know, maybe sign up for your, if you, I don't know if you have a newsletter or website, but then also, uh, you know, be sure to shout out the name of your podcast. And if you have any other last thoughts, I'd love to hear those as well. When, when I lost my, when I lost my job, I had to do a lot of digging and really find out what is important to me and what, what is going to keep me pushing forward? What yeah. is my, what is my purpose? And I really believe that people need to do that. Uh, take the time and, and dig deep, find out who you truly are yeah. uh, because you are not the job that you're doing your, your job, your occupation, that can be a way in which you express your purpose, but it's not you, it's not your identity. So really taking the time to, to figure out who you are and what's important to you. And I think if you dig deep enough, you'll find that, you know, all of us are chasing a, a sense of fulfillment where we want to be happy. That is what I think we're all trying to achieve is that, that sense of fulfillment. Mm -hmm. And throughout history, our history's greatest thinkers, I think, have all come to the same conclusion that when we make our focus adding value to those around us, when we put others first, that is when you get that true sense of fulfillment. Yeah. When, when you experience what it's like to see somebody that you helped achieve something that they didn't think they could achieve. And you're not asking for any, you know, you did it yeah. just out of the kindness of your heart, but you're, you're adding value to somebody that sense of fulfillment, I think is the purest form that you can find. And if we do that in some form or fashion every day, we can feel really good about ourselves and, and experience that happiness. Excellent. Well, uh, Dave, I really, really, really appreciate you coming on. And oh, uh, make sure to give out your website before we, uh, before we oh, sign oh, off yeah, for the day. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, please come to my website. It's hollenbachleadership.com. You can buy my book there. You can check out my podcast. There's uh, mental health resources on there. There's some tools for people uh, that want to develop some leadership skills. Uh, you can book a call with me, but hollenbachleadership.com. And okay. my podcast is From Embers to Excellence. Excellent. Well, Dave, really, 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 really appreciate your time today. Yeah, man. Thank you so much for having me on. All right. Thank you for listening to the Terminal Value Podcast. So if you liked this episode, please share it on your favorite social media and tag me and then tell me what you did or didn't like about this episode so that I will know what to create for you. And in addition, I would like to share with you the most incredible free gift ever. What I am going to do is I am going to give you a three-day, four-night vacation at one of 30 destinations across the United States completely free, with no obligation at all, no timeshare pitch, nothing. In addition to that, what I am going to do is I am going to do a complimentary savings assessment for your business so that you will understand whether it makes sense for us to work together so that I can help to save you money. The value of this offer is literally between thousands and millions of dollars depending on your business. But even if you don't have a business, if you know somebody who does, I would like to extend that offer to them and still provide a free vacation to you. So just go to offer.terminalvalue.biz right now and enter your information so that I can bring your free vacation to you. Remember, that is offer.terminalvalue.biz, and I am looking forward to talking to you.